It's been five years since the animatrix latched onto a hyperactive 10 year old. Now that kid's 15, has a better haircut, and is actually learning how to operate the thing. This is Benton Alien Force, the greater Benton show with cooler characters, aliens, and a much darker animation style. In part two of my ongoing series to recap the prime Benton canon in as little time as possible, let's delve into Benton Alien Force and see just what happened here. If you have friends or family who want to get into Benton but can't sit through the episodes, send them these videos to get them on track. Let's go. So we're picking up five years after the original show. Ben's hung up the armatrix, quit being a superhero, and is trying to live a normal life as a high schooler. And by normal life, I mean occasionally dunking on his old alien antics and pretending the armatrix didn't define his childhood. Grandpa Max has mysteriously disappeared, leaving Ben with nothing but a cryptic hologram message saying, stay safe, don't get involved with the aliens, and oh by the way, the earth is in danger. Naturally, Ben ignores all this advice, digs out the armatrix, and immediately goes full alien hero again. He teams up with a newly chill Gwen and a reformed Kevin. Yep. That Kevin Eleven, the guy who tried to kill him in the last series. Kevin's still rocking with his old vibe, but is now nuanced as it goes. He thinks you're still evil. I'm not evil. I'm nuanced. Ben's mission? Save Grandpa Max by building a team, and maybe, just maybe, avoid blowing up the planet. Episode 1, and Ben already has some cool new aliens with his new recalibrated armatrix. After a plumber, named Magister Labrad, dies helping the crew fight some DNA aliens, Kevin is influenced to do the right thing and join the team. Oh, DNA aliens are these creepy brain squid creatures, ruled under the hybrid species, that attach these xenocytes to human hosts in their pursuit to take over the planet. Kevin being back in the game still comes with some sketchiness on his part. He needs to pay off some old debts. Classic Kevin. Actually, things go south fast. Kevin's big score turns into a hot mess where a bunch of alien thugs crash the scene and try to extract expensive minerals using Kevin's new matter absorption abilities. Ben and Gwen come to save him, against their better judgment, but it's actually revealed that Kevin was doing this to yet another hologram device to give Ben another clue from Grandpa Max. Classic Kevin. Gotta love this new version. Gwen's older brother, Ken, is missing, and in the pursuit to find him, the gang stumbles upon a hybrid base in a small town called Santa Mira that manufactures xenocytes. Ken has been infected and turned into a DNA alien, but Ben is able to remove it with the help of the Omnitrix. Trying to destroy a massive supply of Xenoslaves from being shipped from his base, the team discovers Grandpa Max for the first time, fighting against the hybrid commander. In an act of self-sacrifice, Max uses an unfocused null void projector to blow up the entire hybrid base, seemingly killing himself and the hybrid in the process. Is he dead? I think we all know the answer. Love interest time, Ben's got a crush on a girl named Julie, and decides to impress her with a date at the amusement park, because why be subtle about being an alien-powered teen, right? The carnival rise is at them, which forces Ben to reveal his alien abilities, turning into this humongous dinosaur, or humongousaur, and totally not freaking out Julie. She thinks it's awesome, and starts fangirling over his alien. Ben's basically found the only person on Earth who thinks alien transformations are normal, and they end up picking up a galvanic mechamorph, or upgrade alien, as a pet. This later becomes Julie's ship, as it's also named, to help during big battles. We've seen Ben's changes in terms of his new alien. Kevin's turning around with his villain arc, time for Gwen. Gwen's magic powers are revealed to be inherited genetically, not just through reading the right mantra and creating spell, inherited from this strange woman, Ben and Gwen's long-lost grandmother and Max's wife, Verdona, who is a super powerful energy alien called an Anodite. Verdona attempts to convince Gwen to break out of her human body and embrace her Anodite personality, with all the power that comes along with that, but Gwen has to fight her because she kinda likes being a half-powerful human and living with the gang on Earth. Oh, and she kinda begins to like Kevin. Like, a lot. Time travel episode. Meet Professor Paradox, the ultimate character, a man who was trapped in an eternal time loop for a long, long time. At first, he is pretty freaky to Ben and the crew, as we get his backstory, which reveals him to be an honorable man and one of Ben's most valuable allies in the coming franchise. He can travel through time and alter events, and in this tumultuous episode, shows how cool he can really be. He also has a really nice voice. That's a better question for the man on the moon. Ben 10's 10th alien is finally used, after a lot of hype, and it's revealed to be none other than the one and only Alien X. Alien X completes the list of the main 10 aliens used in the show, including Swampfire, Big Chill, and Echo Echo, and becomes by far the most powerful alien in Ben 10 in animation history. Alien X has the ability to do anything he wants, anything at all, as long as two of his three personalities agree to a decision. When Ben transforms into him, his physical alien body is lifeless and unmoving, while he floats around in Alien X's consciousness, trying to convince his two floating heads, Serena and Bellicus, that he needs Alien X's powers to do X, Y, and Z. And X, Y, and Z could be literally anything. He uses it here to revert time and fix a broken dam, but it later recreates the entire universe. But Serena 
and Balakus can be quite obstinate, as Ben realizes quickly, making Alien X both his most powerful and most useless alien in the roster. Time for Season 2, Ben and a hybrid named Ryan Razik III, which by the way is the German word for purebred, who Ben comically calls Reiny, gets stranded on a desert planet together, and it's basically the universe's worst buddy cop movie. The hybrid hates humans, and Ben hates the hybrid, so naturally they have to work together to survive in this harsh alien wilderness. This episode is basically an excuse for Ben to deliver snarky one-liners, and the hybrid to sulk dramatically about being better than humans, but as they face off against giant sandworms and hostile aliens, they start to respect each other and understand the coexistence thing a little better. After the hybrid's arm gets severed off, Ben uses swamp fire to give him a new one, which makes the hybrid stay behind in the desert planet as a symbol of his failure to stay loyal and pure to his race. It's weirdly wholesome and leaves Ben with a new perspective on his enemies. It's like if Castaway had been written by an alien therapist, the continuous struggle against the hybrid persists, as the team goes undercover at Los Soledad, where Paradox also built a time machine. They discover that the hybrid have erected a cloaking device over the area, concealing a huge mysterious arc-shaped device. It's all built by Cooper Daniels, a young blonde kid who the Tennysons knew from the classic series, and who is now being held hostage by the hybrid for his tech abilities. The gang frees him and they manage to destroy the cloak field which keeps the area in a snowy and cold climate, which the DNA aliens thrive in, and hidden from human eyes. Season finale, the team realizes that they're not just fighting random alien thugs, no, there's an entire alien empire called the hybrid, and they've got plans to quote-unquote purify the earth. Because obviously things weren't epic enough with a full-blown invasion plot, Ben enlists friends and foes alike to team up and fight against this giant threat. Azmuth, the Omnitrix creator, comes back and grants Ben master control, which gives him access to all his old aliens as well as new 1,910,000 in total. So we see Cannonbolt, Upchuck, and Waybig again. The team realizes it's pretty much hopeless to fight them off in the traditional way, so they go to the Hybrid Supreme, who are the top dogs of the hybrid operation. It's actually revealed that the hybrid species is dying off genetically due to the inbreeding from all the genetic supremacy crap. Ben uses the Omnitrix to assign random genetic codes from his aliens to the hybrid, basically changing their genetics with non-pure blood, as they would say, but also saving them in a way. The hybrids see this as sacrilege, and decide to commit mass suicide as the only honorable way out. Out of nowhere, Reiny comes back and assists Ben, showing the hybrid how they can survive as a species and how a human saved his life. The hybrid supreme assigns Reiny as the new supreme, and Ben tells him to call off the war. Peace is achieved in such a cool way, especially for a kid's show. This was mature, badass, and well built up for two whole seasons. Let's see what season three has in store. It's good, right? Vilgax, everyone's favorite alien warlord, returns in all of his, well, he certainly returns. Vilgax has conquered ten worlds, absorbing the powers of the top warriors from all those planets, and he's more determined than ever to steal the Omnitrix. He shows up on Earth like, give me the watcher, prepare to die, and Ben responds with an unusual amount of pride and arrogance. Kevin and Ben try to hack the Omnitrix to get master control, which Asma took away from him again after War of the Worlds, albeit leaving him some old classics. This ends very badly as the entire warehouse is blown up, permanently turning Kevin into a combination of minerals rather than a human with absorption abilities, and releasing four of Ben's aliens as wild creatures loose into the city. Ben and the gang have only a few hours to track down these aliens, add them back into the Omnitrix, and fight Vilgax, and also not die. Yeah, it's all pretty fun to watch, and ends with a huge showdown where Vilgax nearly kills Ben. As he grabs his prize, the Omnitrix comes to life and transforms Ben into Diamond Head, a classic alien we haven't seen yet in Alien Force. Diamond Head kicks Vilgax's ass, sends him packing. Vilgax stomps off, vowing revenge yet again, which we all know will last about five episodes. We see Vilgax again when he frees his scare, you know, Ghost Freak from the original series, from his prison if he vows to tell Vilgax the secrets of the Omnitrix. So the Scare complies, but betrays Vilgax upon his release, traveling to his homeworld of Vilgaxia and converting the planet's populace into hive mind ghost minions. Vilgax flees to Earth and actually begs Ben for help, who reluctantly complies. Vilgax leads the team to his home planet, where they confront the Scare. Ben deceives the Scare into merging with him, attempting to control him using the Omnitrix, as he turns into Ghost for the first time since Classic. But the Scare manages to take control instead. Vilgax weakens the ghost just long enough for Ben to regain control, returning to his human form and ultimately defeating him, freeing Vilgax's people. This marks a special point, as Ben and Vilgax develop a certain respect, even if they still despise each other greatly. Still a rock monster, Kevin teams up with Darkstar, an old foe who needs to absorb energy to keep himself from looking like a deteriorated old corpse, to retrieve an artifact called the Dominus Librium that could cure both of them from their physical ailments, let's say. After Kevin gets cured, Gwen gets suspicious and is baited into Darkstar's trap, as he begins to absorb Gwen's power, but Kevin steps in front of the Dominus Librium and sends all the energy back to where it belongs, restoring Gwen's powers and turning himself and Darkstar back into their mutated forms. Another team up that was bound to happen, but kinda led nowhere. Let me tell you something, random dude watching this video. Ben unlocks an alien called Wrath, who's basically a super aggressive tiger wrestler who never stops yelling. Wrath doesn't believe in talking through his problems, he believes in yelling at him. Naturally, this causes a lot of problems when they're supposed to be 
be handling a low-key mission. Let me tell you something, Jared of Pantophage! You start a war with the Lodans, and I will do it again! Only next time, I will knit your intestines into a sweater! <laughs> Best alien ever. Oh, and Kevin kills the guy who killed his dad. So there's Finale, and Ben's up against Bill Gax, and a new guy, Albedo. Ben's evil twin who can basically do everything Ben can do, but a little smarter and less physically capable. Albedo steals Osmus' newest invention, the Ultimatrix, an Omnitrix with an evolutionary function, basically transforming each alien into a supersized, more badass version of themselves. He and Bill Gax capture Gwen and Kevin as hostages, and Ben gets his ass handed to him by Ultimate Humongosaur, who is like 10 times stronger than regular Humongosaur, and can shoot missiles out of his fingers. Bilgax gets the Omnitrix from Ben and betrays Albedo, imprisoning him with his biote army, which he transforms all of into Ben's aliens. Guess he finally got his dream after all, didn't he? After a lot of grief, Ben uses his voice command to blow up the Omnitrix on Bilgax's wrist. This neutralizes him and fixes Kevin from his monster form. Ben grabs the Ultimatrix from Albedo after threatening him with the same fate and uses his new Ultimate Swamp Fire to crash Bilgax's ship and escape with all of the gang still alive. But the baddie is dead, as we'll find out in the next edition. That's Ben 10 Alien Force. Tell me your thoughts on the series in the comments down below and stay tuned for more adventure if y'all want to see the ultimate alien video leave a like subscribe comment and follow all the socials with the links below i'll see you beautiful ladies and jellyfish in the next one <laughs>